the five year after the July 15 coup attempt. This was in 2016. Uh, it's been five years. Turkey has gone through many, many changes. Um, the, the region has gone through major changes, uh, tectonic changes, I would say. Um, and at, at the global level, we've experienced uh, most recently a big pandemic that, that really changed our lives, uh, all, all the, the entire world. Um, but today we are going to try to be more specific than that uh, and try to focus on Turkish foreign policy and more specifically U.S.-Turkey relationship um, and how that has been impacted by, by the coup attempt that failed in 2016. Uh, today uh, we are having, we have Michael Reynolds. He's a professor at Princeton University. Uh, we also announced that Professor Talib Küçükcan would be with us from Marmara University, a more former member of parliament. Um, I'm hoping he's going to be able to join us. So far, he hasn't been able to. Uh, we hope everything is okay. But uh, for the sake of scheduling, we are going to start the discussion between Michael and I. And I invite our Zoom participants to go ahead and pose questions, uh, raise hands, and I would like to make this as uh, interactive as possible. Um, so, uh, Michael, take, thank you very much for joining us, accepting to speak with us about this. Um, you know a lot about Turkey. You know, <laughs> you're 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 a professor. Uh, you're working on a book uh, on. Turkey, Russia. Uh, we discussed it right before this uh, live stream. Um, and there's not a lot of uh, experts around who understand the intricacies of what happened during the coup attempt and what happened prior to that, how we got there, and what this, you know, Feto Gulen uh, movement uh, that, that, uh, how, what their calculations were and why they set out to do this coup attempt and how we got there. Um, we don't want to focus too much on that. Um, you're welcome to, you know, mention anything uh, you think is relevant. But um, as we discussed earlier, uh, you and I, uh, why don't we start with kind of the perception of U.S. involvement in uh, coup attempts around around the Middle East, in the Middle East, of course, the broader, you know, we don't want to go into Latin America examples and Iran is an example, but it was in the 60s. But can we discuss generally how non-Americans, let's say, especially in the Middle East, how they perceive US role in these coup attempts or militaries, uh, power and politics? What is the perception there? And how do you think that may that, that might be impacting the U.S.-Turkey relations even today. Uh, again, thank you for joining this discussion. Um, uh, floor is you, yours. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Kader, for the invitation uh, to speak. Uh, it's always a, a pleasure uh, to do these sorts, sorts of things. Um, as you mentioned, Turkey is one of the areas that I work on. I'm a you know, professor of uh, Ottoman Turkish history. And as an American citizen, I think it's one of my civic obligations um, to share my knowledge with uh, wider audiences and in particular American audiences. And when I speak to American audiences, I often, I usually take it upon myself. What I, I guess what I see is my value added is that I can explain to American audiences how do things look from the Turkish perspective. Um, you know, as, as you know, I'm actually currently right now in Turkey, and so I've been contacted by a number of uh, Turkish institutions who asked me to comment on the uh, July 15th uh, coup attempt. And the, their questions are often precise, actually begin, as you were hinting, um, are framed sort of, well, you know, the United States has a long history of intervening in uh, the politics of other states and overthrowing governments. And you know, sort of how this is, how does uh, July fifteenth, two thousand sixteen, fit into this context? And I think to start, I'd like to push back on that. 
um, because I, I, I don't think that's a very accurate way to either understand what happened uh, in 2016 and how it affected Turkish American relations. And it certainly is not accurate historically. Uh, so just to start, you know, the United States certainly has been involved uh, in modern history in intervening in the politics, internal politics of countries in the Middle East, and in some cases backing uh, coups. You know, the most uh, famous of those was the overthrow of uh, Mossadegh in Iran in 1953. And, you know, I, let me just flag uh, four other, you know, coups of which the United States, from, particularly from a Turkish perspective, is often believed to have some, uh, have played some role. And we can get into the details of that if you'd like, but let me just flag them right now. So, of course, everyone knows about uh, Mossadegh 1953. Uh, the U.S. Uh, you know, helped participate in his overthrow. Many people see this as a key moment in American-Iranian relations and even invoke it to explain why is it that Iran and the U.S. don't get uh, get along uh, today. I think that's something of an exaggeration or you know, not just something of exaggeration. I don't think that the, the 53 coup attempt is the primary cause, but it certainly did not help American and Iranian relations. And it was an important moment and ultimately turned out, I don't think, well for the United States uh, and certainly not for Iran. But the other ones that come to mind were, you know, the, for, again, from the Turkish perspective, where there's questions, 1980 uh, in Turkey, where there was a coup uh, and there was widespread belief that the United States uh, oversaw that coup or played a particularly important role in it. Uh, I would say also 2013, what took place in Egypt uh, was regarded as many Turks watched that and saw it as a, an indicator of what might happen to Turkey. And they were very disappointed at the minimum with how the United States responded uh, to the overthrow of, of, of Morsi uh, in Egypt. Uh, and that sort of added to Turkish suspicions about the United States. And then, of course, there was 2016, uh, which you know, we, we, we can and probably will come back to. Uh, but I wanted to just flag uh, again uh, a number. I want to make the point that um, two points. One is that there is a history in the Middle East of indigenous uh, coups, and that's important to underscore, uh, in which the United States played no role. Uh, so when one thinks, uh, and the other point I want to make is also just the, the when we think about the you know the pre. 1991 events in the Middle East is the context of the Cold War. And that's also very important to understand, particularly what happens in 1980 in Turkey. That is, it's not as if the United States was the only country in uh, trying to influence these uh, events in the Middle East. Uh, <clears throat> there was, of course, the Soviet Union and its allies. And the Soviet Union was a state dedicated to world revolution, um, explicitly dedicated to that, and was committed uh, to uh, violating uh, the norms of sovereignties in other countries. And to have expected the United States and its local allies uh, in the Middle East to have remained uh, passive in the face of that would both be, I think, historically, um, it would be historically, uh, let's, right, looking for the right term here. Um, I don't want to simply say uh, naive, let's say historically unprecedented to have expected that. And I would say even morally uh, unjust uh, and incorrect if the United States has just uh, maintained uh, a neutrality of sorts. And again, we can, we can come back uh, to that. And that, but that's tied up with, this, uh, with the point I mentioned uh, just a moment ago about the indigenous uh, traditions of coups. So when I think of uh, coups in the modern Middle East, the ones that come to mind in addition to Mossadegh are uh, Nasser in Egypt in 1956, young military officer who overthrows a monarchy in Egypt. And that's followed very soon after that by Abdul Karim Qasim in Iraq, 1958, similar pattern of a young military officer overthrows a monarchy. And one can also put in there Muammar Gaddafi in 1969 in Egypt. Again, another junior uh, military officer who overthrows his government. Libya, you mean? And, excuse me, yes, Libya. Uh, if yeah. I, yeah. Thank you for correcting me if I didn't say Libya. <laughs> um, in Libya, and these were all, uh, there's a commonality of they're all young military officers, and these are all anti-Western uh, coups. None of these, not only were they not engineered by the United States or its, their allies, but they actually had uh, negative effects for relations of those countries with the United States and brought to power uh, <clears throat> individuals and movements that were explicitly anti-American. And given that we're you know, speaking here in a, in a Turkish context, 
I'd like to point out that this indigenous, when I look at those coup attempts, or not excuse me, attempts, rather coups in Egypt, Iraq, and Libya, I see a great parallel uh, with what took place in the Ottoman Empire, in the particular 1908, uh, the Second Constitutional Revolution, also known as the Young Turk Revolution, where a group called uh, Committee of Union and Progress organized itself inside of the Ottoman army, mutinied and forced the Sultan to reintroduce the constitution. Uh, and that was a coup uh, of its own sort. And then a much more, even an even more direct coup that 1913 uh, led by Enver Pasha, a young uh, military officer frustrated with the state of governance in the Ottoman Empire and decided to overthrow uh, the government. And that was, a, I would argue, and will actually do argue, that this was set the pattern for what we later saw in the Middle East with people like Nasser, Abdul, uh, Abdul Karim Qasim, and uh, Qaddafi. Uh, so there is this indigenous tradition uh, that should not be uh, overlooked, that the United States, I think those people who look to the United States and say, you guys have always been doing this sort of thing, uh, both give far much too uh, credit to American abilities. And in that they share a curious uh, uh, similarity, I think with some American policymakers who overestimate America's ability to manipulate events and uh, to manipulate events in the uh, favor of the United States. Uh, the Middle East uh, is at least as complicated as any region in the world and is probably genuinely more complicated. And the idea that the United States is particularly skilled at manipulating actors in the Middle East, I think is a myth that's, uh, again, believed by many people inside of Turkey and outside of Turkey in the Middle East, but also happens to be shared by some American policymakers. Um, and that myth has done no one any good. Uh, so let me, I'll just, I mean, there's a number of areas I could take my comments. Uh, but let me stop now and, and, and give it back to you. If, so where would you like me uh, to, to, to focus? Yeah, I think, Michael, this, is, this was very useful. Um, to, you know, it's important to make this distinction. It's not uh, the, the U.S. involvement in, in some of these uh, coups or coup attempts is, is often, uh, you know, the perception is coming often from... U.S. relationships with militaries around the world and how they support, train, etc. Um, but if we come back to July 15, of course, the dynamic was very different from other Turkish coups in many ways. Uh, previous coups were done uh, within the chain of command. They were successful. There was no uh, blood spilled. Well, not not as part of the attempt, but later on, of course, many people were put in jail, tortured, etc. especially in the 1980 coup. But when you look at the 2016 coup, many people, we talked about this as well before, We many people thought, you know, there would never be a coup again in Turkey. Um, so in, in when you look at it, given that... If, historical perspective you you provided how does it how is it different july 15 uh in terms of the turkish kudra tradition uh let's say and again uh how the perceptions about you know u.s uh, potential or or uh, implied implication in it or part, uh, role in it from the Tur turkish perspective yeah Right. So if um, depending upon how one counts coups, if one wants to count the so-called postmodern coup uh, yeah. in the 1990s, uh, 98, where, yeah. no, yes, 98, where uh, a, a Turkish government was overthrown um, uh, or the, you know, the, the ruling coalition uh, pushed was, out, let's say. pushed out of power. Right. That's probably the yeah, best way to put it. Not by any direct military action, but by the military suggestion that we may take action. And so it yeah. was dubbed as post, uh, the so-called postmodern coup because it wasn't an actual coup. It was merely the threat of a coup was enough to change uh, the ruling uh, coalition inside of Turkey. Yeah. So if one wants to include that, one can say there were four coups in Turkey post-World uh, War II, um, which created, that's one of the things that uh, Americans who study Turkey, one of the first things they kind of learn is that, well, Turkey has this tradition of coups. And I think that may have influenced, incidentally, some Americans' rather 
um, blasé uh, approach to what happened in 2016 and the assumption, well, Turkey, Turks are sort of used to coups taking place. And therefore, this really wasn't, 2016 was not a big shock to Turks. And they underplayed or they were incapable of understanding uh, just how dramatic the events of 2016, July 15th, how they were for Turks. Um, and, you know, I, it was by precisely by knowing a little bit about Turkey, knowing that there's been this, you know, tradition to use that word or pattern might be a better one of coups inside of Turkey, the assumption, well, Turks are used to it. When one would, a better read of that would be to say, okay, Turks are going to lose their patience uh, with coups. Um, this has been a recurring pattern and no one makes the argument that a coup is a positive thing. Um, and that is certainly the case uh, in, in Turkey. And one of the key moments in 2016 was the knowledge among the Turkish population that we do have, ha have had this pattern of coups um, we are not going to tolerate it anymore. And as uh, multiple vast numbers of Turks demonstrated, we are willing to put our lives on the line. Uh, and you got masses of people coming out on the night of July 15th uh, to stop the coup. Uh, and over 250 people gave their lives in the coup. Uh, and that is something, again, I think, you know, any of the Americans who are listening to me uh, have to take that into account. This was, as you mentioned, a far bloodier coup than anything that Turkey had seen. And in addition, of course, to the people dying uh, in the streets was also the blatant use of uh, fire power by those attempting uh, to throw a coup, including dropping bombs on the Turkish parliament, uh, which is really quite shocking when uh, you go, if you had the chance to go to the parliament and actually see uh, the results of uh, bombs being dropped on your own parliament and the strafing by uh, uh, attack helicopters of uh, various targets inside of Ankara. And the fact that both in Istanbul and Ankara, you had uh, jet fighters uh, flying overhead, deliberately creating sonic booms, giving the impression that the cities were under uh, artillery barrages, which also added to the psychological uh, disruption and fear among residents uh, in Istanbul and Ankara. And you know, my friends across the political spectrum, from those who supported the government to those who do not in any way support the government, were all uh, united in emphasizing to me just how uh, disturbing they found that evening and how angry they were um, and shocked by what had happened uh, that evening. So psychologically, I think for the Turkish population, this was an even bigger shock than the, I think the 1980 coup, uh, at least when the 1980 coup started. You know, what happened in the aftermath of the 1980 coup, um, which is an, incidentally was a much, um, a much bloodier uh, response and a much, mm, I don't know what shall I say, um, no, uh, vigorous isn't, isn't, isn't probably quite, one could say I wasn't trying to look for the right word, uh, not merely vigorous crackdown, but a much more severe, I think one can say, crackdown uh, that took place after 1980 uh, compared to what took place after uh, 2016, both in terms of number of people actually put in jail uh, and numbers of people uh, executed, et cetera. Um, the, they're, they're incomparable, which is not to say that in the aftermath of 2016, there wasn't an immense uh, reaction uh, from uh, the government. Um, but In the, terms, yeah. yes, go on. Um, that's, uh, you, you highlighted how, you know, the, the, how it unfolded and, um, but in terms of the nature of it, right, it's, it's not this movement that, that was supposed to be, you know, for education, they, they were allowed to participate in the bureaucracy openly, etc. Um, because they they weren't able to at least in the uh, you know 90s or earlier 80s, but with the AK party governments in 2000s, you know everybody was uh, more and more allowed to participate in the bureaucracy, etc. But we found out darker <laughs> sides, uh, a darker side of this movement. I don't want to go too much in the detail because we we. We wanted to, we advertised that we would talk about Turkish foreign policy after the QIP event. Um, so when you look at that, of course, this was a quote unquote movement that was international and global, right? It had, and uh, its leader had already moved to, uh, to 
to the United States in 1999 as part of the previous, you know, soft coup you mentioned uh, or postmodern coup you mentioned. Uh, so uh, when you look at that dynamic um, and its relationship uh, to the to the Turkey's its its impact on the Turkey's relationship with the U.S., how do you see that? Um, Right, so I guess you to emphasize for those uh, in the audience, again, without going into all the details, because it is a very um, long uh, story. And, and those, anyone interested in getting more details on uh, the nature of the relationship uh, between uh, Fethullah Gulen, the leader of uh, this movement, and which there's indisputably, in my eyes, uh, played a major role in the coup attempt of uh, July 15th, 2016. Uh, the nat nature of the relationship between Gulen, the United States and Turkey, uh, I would recommend people can uh, go read two things. One, they can find the thing that I wrote. Uh, if they just Google my name with uh, damaging democracy, it's probably the easiest way to find it. Uh, the best version of that is in the book that was published on the 2015 uh, coup uh, with the editor, um, um, Hakan, um, Hakan, his name's uh, escaping me right now. I hope he'll... Uh, he'll uh, Yavuz. Yavuz. Hakan Yavuz. Hakan uh, Yavuz. But you should be able to find an earlier version of it on the internet. And the other I would uh, recommend, it was an article that came out, I think it was about three weeks after mine, that came out in The New Yorker. Um, mm -hmm. And the... Uh, the, the, the author of that um, article uh, will come back uh, to me in a moment. Um, but both of those, I think both what I wrote and uh, this article in The New Yorker, which is quite detailed on Fethullah Gulen and the, you know, the, the possibility of the U.S. role in it, should be enough to convince, I think, many fair readers to see there's certainly something very odd uh, going on there. Uh, and as you mentioned, Fethullah Gulen uh, fled uh, Turkey in 19, was it nine, it came to the U.S. in 99, uh, remained in the U.S. Uh, despite the fact that their own Department of Homeland Security uh, recommended in 2008 against the idea that Gulen should be able to remain in the U.S. Uh, and despite the fact that Gulen and this movement were tied up with uh, a range of uh, scandals in the schools that he and this movement oversaw in the United States, uh, in multiple states, uh, there was a, a clear pattern of all sorts of uh, fraud and uh, criminal activity on the part of his movement. And again, you don't have to take my word for that. You can simply watch 60 Minutes, uh, the investigative uh, journalist uh, television show in the United States actually did a series on that. Yet somehow Glenn was able to remain in the U.S. where he still is uh, to this day and where we know that key actors in the uh, coup attempt of July 15th, 2016, uh, visited him uh, in a matter of days right before the coup. And they were located at the air bases where this coup uh, was uh, effectively run from. And multiple people who were tied up in the attempted coup uh, were tied uh, to Gulen. And then again, I, I won't go into the details now, I've written about it and there's a long history uh, documented by uh, people on both uh, across the political spectrum in Turkey, on both the polit Turkish political right and on the political left, pointing to this movement and how it was engaged in subverting uh, the government and more generally, I would say, subverting law and order in Turkey and subverting uh, democracy in Turkey. Uh, there's a wide consensus on that. And the fact is this uh, the leader of this movement happens to be in the United States, which generates a whole, a wide degree of suspicion in Turkey of so how is it possible that the United States did not play a role in uh, July 15th, 2016, and given that this movement did, and this, uh, the head of the movement has been in the United States now for over two decades. And, you know, again, I, as I just mentioned, uh, there are enough there were enough reasons before 2016 to suggest that this uh, man should not be in the United States. He should be either in prison in the United States or in Turkey. Um, now I could go into you know, to you know, what may or may not have happened yeah. on July 15th because I'm not. I should, let me make it clear. I'm not saying the United States uh, was behind the coup. There is no uh, hard evidence of that, and I think one can explain what happened on July 15th, uh, 2016, without resorting to the idea that the United States ran this coup because 
uh, yeah, I, I could get in, in, into the details of that, but um, let me throw it back over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I was Googling it and uh, Rich was kind enough to write it in the chat as well. Dexter Filkins. Yes. The 30 year coup on, uh, on New Yorker, I think October of that year. Um, so um, if we try to focus on the uh, foreign policy aspects, uh, what happened since then, uh, some, you know, it was very interesting. Uh, Turkey had been calling on the US international community to sort of intervene in Syria. It had drawn up plans to intervene in Syria, support the opposition, create safe zones, etc. All these proposals were ultimately, you know, either shut down or, you know, were discussed endlessly, but without uh, any action. Right after the coup, however, uh, in August of 2016, uh, Turkey um, decided to intervene across the border into Syria on its own with its own military uh, unilaterally. And that border was being held by I, uh, PKK and, well, PKK Syrian branch, YPD and ISIS. Um, and then Turkey conducted several other operations in Syria, basically, uh, there's areas right now under Turkish controlled where, you know, IDPs uh, are, are living in uh, at least, uh, you know, under Turkish protection away from Assad's barrel bombs and all that. So that was a courageous, let's say, quote unquote, compared to previous, you know, years, Turkey always, not always, but most of the time intervened as part of a broader coalition, often NATO missions, etc. But after the coup attempt, there was this new sense, I guess, uh, within within the Turkish security establishment that you know they got this weight off their shoulders in many ways, and they um, and they they took um, these they undertook these military mm -hmm. interventions in in uh, Syria. Uh, in Libya, it wasn't. It was through the agreement with the Libyan government. In Nagorno-Karabakh, through you know, they helped Azeris retake the uh, lands that were occupied by Armenia for several decades. Um, so when you look at those developments, um, of course, Turkey supported Qatar in the Qatar crisis. Uh, you know, Eastern Mediterranean, Ukraine. You know, some drones were just sold to Ukraine. They received delivery today. So we see this much stronger sort of Turkish um, actions in the region, at the regional level, not just, you know. So what, what do you think, when you look at that, what kind of dynamics do you observe in terms of, you know, post-coup Turkish foreign policy? What, what hits you? What, what what is striking to you when you look at those developments? Well, to, to uh, I can say, I suppose you, one way of framing your question might be, or to, to reword it might be, uh, how does one explain uh, Turkey's much more independent uh, foreign policy after the coup, and to what extent did the coup affect that? And uh, you know, there I would answer. I, I basically, I suppose, I want to highlight three factors. One would be a, to just underscore, and I don't think enough American uh, audiences have understood this, that Turkey's aspiration to run an independent foreign policy is something that goes to the heart of the Turkish Republic. It is almost the, um, the underlying uh, mission of the Turkish Republic. It was to establish, when they established a Mustafa Kemal, it was not to establish a state that would be uh, bound uh, to the West from uh, now until eternity, now meaning 1923, it was uh, a, an effort to create a state that would achieve total sovereignty and independence uh, for the Turkish people. Um, so that's something, this is not a new aspiration for Turkey. Uh, the, the idea this has been a goal laid, again, it was the, uh, the underlying, the driving motive of the uh, Turkish Republic. So there's this long 
running aspiration of Turkey. And this is actually you know, really not that unusual for any state to want to be independent. But I would say in Turkey, there's a particularly, um, uh, you know, if I want to use, let me, if I could use the word prickly, um, um, aspiration or deep, maybe I should say a deeper aspiration, a much more conscious aspiration of, of we should be independent and we want to be independent in all various ways. So I would point to that. I would point to it. So that's a long-term structural factor. I would also point you, since you mentioned Syria, you know, a, a shorter term, or let's say in this context, a more medium term factor, be the fact that the uh, both the United States and Turkey were cooperating together in Syria and uh, their Syria policies blew up in their face, in their faces. That is both the United States and Turkey failed in Syria. Uh, where for the United States, that failure is something we've never really had to deal with directly because at the end of the day, we're very, the United States is very far away from uh, Syria. Whereas as you know, for Turkey, it's right on the border. And Turkey has two, at least two major problems with Syria. And that is one, the, uh, the huge numbers of Syrian refugees inside of Turkey. Um, mm. And that affects Turkish society at all levels. Uh, it's a daily reminder uh, to Turkey that Syria is our neighbor and there's a big problem there. And we have to deal with it and uh, we have to pay a cost for it. And then the other is the uh, fact that Syria has been used as a, um, uh, a base of sorts by the PKK, which isn't a new thing. Of course, this goes back to the 1980s, the PKK was using it. And, uh, and that is uh, a major, you know, arguably the major uh, security problem uh, for Turkey. Um, and so the failure of cooperation with the US inside of Syria uh, had forced Turkey therefore to say, look, we can't, if we can't work with the Americans productively, we're gonna have to work without them. Um, coming to the more short-term, uh, factor, and that is how did the coup uh, attempt, uh, how did things change after uh, July uh, 15th? And I think there, the, you know, what was very disappointing, I can say this as an American citizen, was the poor handling of the United States, uh, and being generous, I think, in reacting to the coup. And by that, I mean, through statements by leading American officials, um, calling on both sides, uh, of, of as, as the coup was unfolding, uh, to refrain from uh, violence and to obey the law, which they're already there, you're putting on an equal footing, uh, the people throwing the putsch and those in the democratically legal uh, government. Uh, and that is at best uh, poorly worded. Uh, the American response was also very delayed. Uh, I might mention here too, I heard about this shortly after the coup and it's now been confirmed um, by a number of sources uh, outside, is that in the hours before the coup, one of the, the key warnings that Erdogan received came uh, from Russia. Um, and there's nothing really conspiratorial weird about that. Um, back in 2016, Russia and Turkey were still very much uh, at bad relations with each other relating to Turkey's uh, shooting down the Russian debt in, oh, that had been flying over Syria and then crossed into Turkish uh, airspace. And as a result of that, the Russian military, quite understandably, was keeping a close eye on how the Turkish military was functioning uh, inside of Turkey and noticed that a number of very odd things were taking place in uh, Turkish uh, air bases and alerted the Erdogan uh, to this fact. And from my understanding, one of the questions, why didn't the United States provide a similar uh, warning of, of that, even though you know, Americans were at some of these bases um, at which the coup uh, was was run from. I've, I you know I don't know that the United States did not provide a you know for certain. I don't know that no advance warning was provided, but that's my understanding. And that so the 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 rather clumsy, awkward American response, the slow response uh, to the coup attempt, which some Turks, many Turks, I shouldn't say some, many Turks interpreted as being uh, one that was at best indifferent. Uh, to the government and maybe even uh, quite you know, uh, sympathetic uh, to the putschists or you know, those throwing the coup. That combined with the comparison uh, you know, to the Russians and the others' uh, response to the coup suggested that there, you know, can we really rely upon the United States? Uh, and some have suggested this is precisely why actually Erdogan uh, preferred to buy the S-400 uh, missiles uh, from Russia, kind of underscoring the fact that, okay, what are S-400 missiles useful for? Air defense, and I can have total confidence in my own uh, armed forces 
uh, and to underscore that, therefore, I'm going to buy uh, missile defense from, from, from uh, Russia. Uh, you know, whether or not that's exactly what was the exact nature of the Turkish thinking on the S-400s, you know, I don't know. Again, this is one idea that's been thrown out there. But to, to summarize this, I think the, the underlying point would be that uh, Turkish confidence in the United States is very much damaged uh, as a result of uh, July 15th, 2016. And you know, whether that is, you know, that drop in confidence is totally supported by the facts is maybe uh, immaterial. That was Turkish perceptions. And that's something that American officials have to understand, they have to deal with, and they have to face, I think, the, the fact that the Turks have pretty good reasons for those suspicions, which again, I'm not saying those suspicions are justified, but when one looks at them from the Turkish perspective, uh, they make sense and one has to ha ask questions, you know, why wasn't the United States more, more forthcoming, or uh, you know, uh, wasn't more at, proactive uh, in supporting the government uh, in condemning the coup attempt? And then the big question of why is it that Fethullah Gulen, for example, uh, is still remaining uh, in Turkey, and you know they come back to uh, Syria. You know how is it possible the United States could collaborate so openly and so willingly uh, with an offshoot of the PKK? When I say offshoot, I mean a brand, uh, a branch, um, uh, not as if it's an offshoot which is no longer tied to the PKK. You know, it's an arm of the PKK. And uh, as I've, I've mentioned before, and I'll just say it again right now, I think you know, for an American audience to understand this, the equivalent would be something like, if you can imagine that Turkey was arming a branch of uh, Al Qaeda in, uh, in Mexico, and that was, you know, they had been engaged in carrying out operations inside the United States. I don't think that's an exaggeration. And in many ways, I'm actually surprised that Turkish-American relations um, didn't get worse in these intervening years. Um, I guess despite, like, yeah. Yes. Like you said, uh, part of it was that, you know, um, both the PKK issue and the uh, FETO issue, Fethullah Gülen's uh, extradition, its role in the, in the um, coup attempt, um, those were managed partly because this new approach to Turkish foreign policy, right? The, when you when Turkey was able to clear the border from both PKK and you know the 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 ISIS forces, um, it was able to have a bit more confidence about direct threat emanating from Syria. And then for a long time, Trump looked like he he wanted to leave Syria, so Turkey's footprint expanded in in. Syria and it was able to kind of self reassure, I guess, uh, on the PKK front. But on the Gulen front, of course, uh, there, the I would say this is my argument, but their influence in the U.S. has diminished greatly, partly because that influence was coming from Turkey. Their their networks within the Turkish bureaucracy that the, they were able to kind of self feed their organization and use those resources in the United States. Um, and of course, neither issue is going anywhere, anywhere anytime soon, but uh, perhaps Turkey was able to, with some of the new foreign policy moves, kind of self-reassure and take matters into its own hands in some ways. And of course, like, you know, last two years are um, good friend in audience, uh, Rich worked in his team. Ambassador Jeffrey's efforts also helped um, uh, Turks feel a bit more like, you know, okay, the U.S. is listening to us more on this front. And, you know, t they continued uh, the operations against PKK in Iraq. They never stopped. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I don't want to go into that uh, just as a contribution to what you just said. Um, those dynamics may have played some role in it. So we moved from, you know, if you want to comment anything about Trump Erdogan relationship, feel free. We have 15 minutes left. I, I encourage people to ask questions. Some of them have already asked questions, but I want to ask you the, the Biden administration, right? It's been about six months. He has a fundamentally different approach to foreign policy. He wants to work with allies through alliances. He want, he's emphasizing institutions. 
uh, and less one-on-one -on -one personal relationships between the leaders. So how do you see that dynamic playing out in the years to come? Also, I want to underline both Turkey and US now have sent each other political appointees as ambassadors. Uh, this could be a good thing, right? Um, how do you see that? Uh, though, how do you see Biden administration's relationship with, with the Turkish administration right now and in the months ahead? Uh, yeah, so just let me, you, you mentioned uh, Trump and Erdogan. I guess I just want to make one small point sure, there. Sure. Unfortunately, everything with the coverage of Trump and foreign policy, like the coverage of Trump and everything else, it all was refracted through the prism of American domestic politics. And therefore, there's this idea that Trump and Erdogan uh, are both particularly close to each other. And there's some you know, special dynamic between the two. And I think that got a lot of exaggeration in the United States. And not enough attention was uh, put uh, on the uh, tensions between the Trump administration and Turkey. They, they did not get along all the time. And you had the, uh, I was about to say wonderful example. Wonderful might, might not be the right um, uh, adjective. Let's say colorful uh, incident where uh, Trump's letter to Erdogan, yes. uh, which basically you know, threatened uh, to wreck the Turkish economy. And I think that was a, a rather ugly moment in Turkish-American uh, relations, which again sent a signal, I think, to a lot of Turks, is, you know, can we work with this government, even when repeatedly written, uh, led by someone very favorable uh, to our country, is yet resorting to such crude uh, language uh, threatening us and not you know, and, and, th and threatening, you know, not just diplomatic relations, but, the, you know, the very uh, economy of the country. Um, <clears throat> so not everything under, you know, Trump in uh, Turkey uh, was wonderful, uh, although, you know, things could have been worse. And I think, you know, Trump made the right decision uh, on, on Syria on a number of uh, scores. I would disagree, though, that there's any, then there's been, Biden represents any major shift. Uh, you know, there, there's a remarkable thing about American foreign policy, its consistency which I have increasingly become critical of American foreign policy. So I don't see that. Not to, not to be rude, just to, not to interrupt, but uh, I, I, that's why I said approach, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't say it's, you know, policies were going to be right. drastically different, but in terms of how they approach foreign policy, they're, uh, and that, that I wanted to under, underline that because of the personal nature of the previous administration the, in terms of policymaking, foreign policymaking. So I see, yes, yeah, so th th thank you for that. I think, uh, so to come to the, the Biden administration, let me underscore some of the, the more positive things. I think both, it's clear that both Turkey and uh, the Biden administration understand that they need each other across a range of, yeah. of issues. And uh, the Biden wanted to send the message to Turkey, look, you can't count on us uh, don't expect that you have total leverage or not total leverage, but that you have um, the winning leverage over us. Uh, and because that myth sometimes has, has been in Turkey that, you know, look, the United States, at the end of the day, they really need us. And uh, you know, the fact is both countries need each other uh, across. It's in the benefit of both sides to cooperate with each other. And I think that's now understood on uh, both sides. And there's been attack both in Washington and Ankara to tr try to cooperate more closely. Uh, the nomination of uh, Flake as ambassador is very interesting. Uh, it may be a very positive thing. It may be a signal that, you know, political appointees is a way of signaling, okay, this is especially important uh, relationship uh, to me. On the other hand, you know, one of the questions I, I don't know is, you know, Flake is a, a Republican. Does that mean he's going to be particularly close to, to, to Biden? Uh, it's an un unusual, uh, very interesting appointment. And I don't know... Um, you know, what does it say about Turkish-American uh, relations? But I think we do know, I think we can say the Biden administration uh, does understand uh, that Turkey is important and they want, they've given some thought to how do we handle Turkey. I and, just, just yes. to inter interject something small. Yeah, I agree with you. And then I was just thinking that it's his, you know, friends and network in, the, in Congress Right. If there is a there's something about Turkey coming up in terms of a resolution or something, they would they would think of maybe just giving him a call as opposed to, you know, a non-political appointee. They may not know who would have to go through the, you know, secretary of state, perhaps. 
Right. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know what the calculations are either, you know, by uh, you know, the Biden administration or, or Flake himself. Uh, you know, again, usually people, when they want a cushy post as ambassador, would not choose a contentious, you know, complicated, really? messy part of the world. Um, so either uh, this says great things about Flake's uh, ambitions or it says uh, very bad things about his, his uh, common sense and wisdom. <laughs> so if he thinks this is going to be a fun, interesting post. Um, I think he's going to find out something different. If he's saying, I want to go to some place to really help American foreign policy, then this could be a very good thing for both Turkey uh, and the United States. Um, so Turkey, we'll see, Turkey but, made a political appointment for the first time to the United States. So that's also interesting. Right. Yes. Uh, yes. So, well, I, you know, they, uh, it, it's been very clear, I think, that Erdogan has come around to understanding any of these. He's overextended the, the Turkey in a number of areas. And one of the, the things that he needs to do to get out of that overextension is to patch up things uh, with Washington. Again, you know, when I speak to American audiences to explain Turkey, I often put an emphasis upon the things that America has done to alienate Turkey. And I don't think, you know, I don't think this should be uh, underestimated. And I am surprised in some ways that Turkish-American relations aren't worse. But I, you know, I could say point to things that Turkey has done to alienate the United States, which are also quite serious. Um, mistakes that Ankara has made over the course of the past uh, five years. And there are real reasons for American frustration and justified reasons for American frustration. Uh, and, you know, so, you know, I'm guardedly optimistic that at least things aren't going to get a lot worse between Turkey and the United States. And, you know, there, there's hope to think that things might get marginally better. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I have no uh, great complaints or criticism of the Biden administration thus far. Although, again, to come back to the, you know, the Glenn thing, um, you know, you mentioned there's certainly that movement has been dealt a blow, but they're still around. Uh, they're still a force in Washington, D.C., and uh, they, they got to where they got, I think and this is the key thing. I don't think it was so much the United States was in the Gulen movement. I think it was much more the Gulen movement manipulating the United States. And you know, I point out to Turkish audiences, look, um, they got to where they got inside of Turkey by manipulating Turks. And if you think that the Americans will be able to figure out what this movement is about better than Turks themselves, better than uh, Turks who are practicing Muslims bring that into their politics weren't able to figure out these guys entirely. How do you think the Americans can do that? And uh, I think you know, the, the story of the Glenn movement, I think, is very much one of how they were able to uh, fool and manipulate uh, a number of Americans. And I wish those Americans, uh, some of them, I think, have, have woken up to that fact, but I wish more would. Uh, and I would, I would like to see um, rather than have this issue swept under the carpet, I'd like to see uh, it resolved. Yeah. And that being resolved with uh, Gulen being put on trial, either in the United States for the crimes committed by his organization and, or in, in Turkey for that matter. Yeah. Michael, there's a specific question about that. Perhaps I'll just bring that in. Um, and it says, do you think what, um, the, what kind of clue they mean, I guess, evidence the U.S. needs um, to accept that Gulen is behind the coup. Turkey has delivered a lot of uh, files to about them to the United States. Um, so that's the question. Yeah, and my answer to that, that's my question as well. Uh, you know, so the, from what I understand, Turkey has submitted a huge range of documents uh, asking for extradition. The United States says that they're not uh, sufficient. I have not seen that documentation. I mean, from what I do know, there should be no uh, real doubt, but I'm, you know, these, there yeah. are these technicalities involved. Uh, I don't know what's, what's behind that. Yeah. Um, another hard question to answer perhaps, but US and Turkey are members of NATO. How is the military cooperation in the recent, uh, after I guess the recent NATO meeting in Brussels uh, with uh, President uh, Biden in power um, in this period? Uh, so I, I can't speak to the specifics of how things were improved after the meeting. You know, all I can say is that, you know, from my understanding, occasionally again, mildly op optimistic. But that does uh, remind me to underscore one of the things that did suffer after the July 15, 2016, uh, were the military to military relations between the United States and Turkey, which have always been quite important uh, because that's one of the, 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 the key maybe the, probably you know, the key uh, pillar of Turkish-American relations has been in the security sector. And the Turkish and American militaries have always been uh, worked quite closely together. 
and have communicated well. And that has suffered a great deal uh, and took even more uh, damage after the uh, 2016. And uh, that's something I think really should be rebuilt for the sake of, of both countries, simply for the fact that having more people who know each other makes communication uh, that much better. Mm -hmm. And so regardless, of the, and that's not to say that they need to cooperate on every issue, but rather to say when they disagree, if they can talk to each other and express why is it that they disagree, precisely over what do they disagree, that's much easier when you actually have people who know each other, who've served together. Um, and that would be one thing that would be nice to see both Ankara and uh, Washington to put more of an emphasis uh, upon is greater military to military cooperation, um, mm -hmm. not because they need to carry out joint military operations against anyone else, but just so that they know each other and can speak. Yeah, I think that I was in Brussels. Uh, the, the debates there were, were interesting. The NATO agenda has been broadened greatly now to include uh, climate change, potential threats from, you know, China, um, the technological changes. So it's going to be interesting to see. One of the questions, last question is coming, it, it, it's saying that the US-Turkey relationship is, is defined a lot, but greatly by Cold War dynamics. And, you know, you see a lot of sort of prejudices or misinformation about Turkey is still kind of left over of that. And you mentioned the military mil to military cooperation being very important. Some of the dynamics or some of the expectations are also kind of in that kind of Cold War mentality. Why aren't they just aligning with us? Uh, I would say there's a lot more realization of that dynamic and i think a lot of military leaders understand we don't live in those times anymore but still i guess some of the reflexes and perceptions might be still there um so um one of the the, the question uh is saying do you see any flexibility or improved understanding in the in the years ahead away from that kind of Cold War approach? That's, that's an excellent question. Uh, you know, Cold War is over three uh, decades in, in the past. Uh, it is about time that people moved out of that framework. And I think finally, I think the United States and, and uh, you know, those in America who deal with Turkey are finally moved out uh, beyond uh, that and have realized this isn't Turkey-American relations. Turkey can't simply see, be seen as an extension uh, Tur contemporary Turkey can't be seen simply as an extension of Cold War Turkey. And, and, and to be honest, we didn't understand Cold War Turkey. That's, that was a myth um, created both, I think, by Turkish and American uh, elites about the, 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 the nature of the Turkish-American uh, alliance during the Cold War. There is a sort of a very uh, sanitized uh, version believed very much, I think, more on the American side, where you know Turkey doesn't loom very large in the American imagination. So I think you know, for Turkey, uh, America is something every Turk has to wake up every day at some level and think about. Whereas even uh, American foreign policy experts, you know, Turkey is just one of many uh, points on the, the horizon. Um, so I think you know, I think Turks have many less illusions about the relationship with the United States during the Cold War. Um, than do uh, Americans. Uh, but we do have the architecture, you know, NATO was uh, developed in the Cold War. Um, I personally actually believe that NATO, we would have all been better off had NATO expanded uh, at the end of uh, the Cold War and something, uh, another alliance established instead. So I'm not saying the United States should have uh, cut its ties with its uh, NATO allies, but I think we would have benefited far more had we actually restructured everything. Um, that's a subject for an entirely different conversation, but there is sort of an echo from the Cold War in contemporary uh, Turkish-American relations, and that's the standoff uh, with Russia. And that's one of the things that reminds Americans of the importance of Turkey and its geography. Uh, you've mentioned Ukraine's come up uh, a number of times. And that is the question, how do you uh, contain Russia, to use that word? Again, this is a, I, I disagree with a lot of American uh, policy towards Russia. I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, 
Uh, but it is one area, I think at least the, the, the tension between America and Russia has served to remind uh, people how, again, the importance of Turkish geography and the importance of Turkey as uh, an ally. And you know, others would right now listen to me, or probably, what do you mean Turkey is an American ally, they're a Russian ally, which is not the case. Uh, Turkey has cooperated with Russia, uh, but to call it an ally is, uh, is, would be a, not simply an exaggeration, it would be simply incorrect. And um, that is, uh, you know, that, that's an area, let me say an area where there can be fruitful grounds for Turkish-American cooperation uh, is regarding policy towards Russia. The other one being, and I think the really big one is with Iran. Uh, Iran, this is again, a very difficult issue for the United States. It's a very difficult issue for Turkey as well. And I think that's one area where I wish both Turkey and the United States would talk more constructively uh, over the long term. What are we going to do about Iran? Can we come up with policies that will be mutually beneficial to us and ultimately as well uh, to Iran? Because if things go yeah. very bad with Iran uh, down the road, they're already bad. Uh, things could get a lot worse, I guess I wanted to score, which isn't in anyone's interest. And this is an area where again, it's extremely important uh, for Turkey um, even more important, again, more important for Turkey than to the United States because Turkey is actually in uh, the region. And uh, you know, this, this is another area where uh, Turkey and the United States uh, have a lot of ground on which they should and can and need uh, to cooperate. Well, Michael, uh, this was very <laughs> extensive, thorough. It included uh, a great historical perspective often you know missing in these debates uh, we simply discuss what happened last week oftentimes i really appreciate your comments and your time uh if you wanted to add anything last words i'll i'll let you do it um but other than that this has been a great uh, discussion thank you so much for your time and your comments um yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Hey, I suppose we have gone into some depth, but I always feel coming out of these conversations, we only just barely skimmed over things. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we simply mentioned, uh, you know, Russia, Ukraine a couple of times. And of course, time is, uh, is never enough for these discussions to go. Maybe you and I will, will cook up something again. <laughs> right. No, I, my, my main goal on, on these things, I, I, hope, I'm able to, yeah. I'm, hope I'm able to spark, um, provoke some uh, thoughts among uh, the listeners. You do that and very skillfully. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again for giving me the chance to speak. Yeah, thank you to our um, attendees on Zoom and those who followed us on social media. Um, again, we, we've had a great discussion with Dr. Michael Reynolds of Princeton University.